sounding good. You're listening to Sound Opinions. I'm Greg Cott with Jim DeRogatis. Uh, we're here at the Goose Island Barrel House with Twin Peaks. Welcome, guys. What's up? Yo, Thanks hey. for having us. A bunch of Chicago guys made good. <laughs> if you play the Barrel House, you must have made it, right? You're, you're, this, is the, this is like uh, playing... Uh, the stadium in London, Wembley in London for yeah, Chicago fans. I, I hate it's to tell you. It's a good measure of success. <laughs> I like that. I hate to tell you, but you do have to take that barrel out of the truck before you pull away. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> You're being framed. All right, so you guys, young band, uh, you know, look, looking at your histories, there's been some kind of musical involvement, it seems like, in almost half, half your lives, if not more, right? You guys have all been playing music in some kind of incarnation working on bedroom projects, what are working together in various incarnations. I think a, a good place to start would be, let's go around each band member and talk about that light bulb moment where you said to yourself, music is what I want to do for a living, or music is what mo motivates me to get up in the morning and live. <laughs> Katie, you want to start? And we'll just go down the line here. Um. Well, I feel like there's been many moments like that throughout my life, uh, recurringly, but uh, for instance, one was just going on our first tour uh, when we had just graduated high school and playing house shows every night, crashing on floors, playing to people who were having a blast mm -hmm. and having a blast ourselves. And I remember talking to a band called Teenage Moods in Minneapolis, and uh, I've, I've mentioned this story before, uh, when people have asked, and is one of the bassists in the band at the time, was just saying, you guys are going to college, why are you doing that? Right. <laughs> Keep doing this. And it, it just really stuck with me, and I was like, yeah, I mean, that's what I would like to do. And I didn't buy it at the time that I would, but here we are. Right, right. Katie, do, me, do us a favor, and the audience, go down the line, introduce your bandmates, and uh, let them know what they do in the band. Well, yeah, I'm Katie, and I play uh, the theremin. And this is Jack. <laughs> he plays bass and he sings. It's Connor. He plays plays the drums. It's Colin with the stash. He plays keyboards and guitar and sings. And that's Claysif, and he plays guitar and sings. Cool. So, so Jack, let's go to you next. What uh, What about your? Uh, well, I guess I guess mine would be a similar thing. I, I, like the first few DIY shows we started playing in Chicago. Um, that was big for me because, well, it's big for all of us because um, me and Katie and, and Connor at least had been going to these shows since we were like 16 years old. And it took us a really long time to like kind of break through into that uh, community because it is a really, it's kind of an exclusive thing. Or it was, mm -hmm. it, it isn't really anymore. But um, yeah, those first couple times where we actually, we were, we were involved it was like it was very validating and uh the they everyone kind of took us in with really open arms and you know that it, it kind of took off from there for you us. felt you felt accepted like okay we can fit in here yeah yeah absolutely we should yeah. we should take a second to explain what you're talking about you two so far about diy house shows because i think one of the great failings in rock journalism right now is to not uh, be attacking the age limits. When the drinking age of 21 was imposed, and in this city, Chicago in particular, it is so almost impossible for a club to get an all ages license, right. right? And who cares about live music most? It's kids the age you guys were, and you can't go see legitimate shows in a safe licensed venue. So, you know, there's an upside to people doing a basement show or a VIP uh, or a VFW lounge show, right? But, you know, why aren't there clubs that do that? I, I don't know. Have you got a thought on that, uh, Connor? Um, well, I mean, it's just, I don't know why. I mean, I, I know why, but... I politics, know, rotten why politics. They make it's it Chicago, so hard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's rough. I mean, I still, like, there were so many shows I couldn't go to, you know, even being in a band even, like, a year ago, you know? Yeah. Well, um, there were shows that we were supposed to play that we couldn't yeah. play, you know, that, that, that has happened to us before. I remember showing up at Cole's Bar one time to play uh, some film festival in Chicago. I think it was like an IFC fest, and we showed up, and they were like, you guys are 19? No way. Like, just oh. get out of here. Wow. We right. still got paid. And it's even, worse. it's even worse on the south and west sides, sure. right, where all that violence is happening on the streets, and kids your age who want to get into hip-hop or want to get into R&B or want to get into house music, uh, they can't play either. 
there's yeah. not a lot yeah there's not a lot of options that's true it's uh it's pretty dark and lame and i don't know if i could give you the the reasons why or you know it's it's tough it seems like it's been that way for a long time but there's also been a enduring community that whoever you know whoever's running the 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 houses or lofts or whatever they're throwing the underground shows it's a rotating cast of members or people who are you know being at the forefront of it but i think that's just you know that's part of the drive of y young artists wanting to you know have control over their art and yeah. uh and the scene that's around it and so that that thrives and a lot of the people running these spots are people who are in their late 20s and 30s who were there and they're saying i don't want that to be what these kids have to go through. Right. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting because I think uh, you're part of a wave and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going back a few years before you guys, but like a band like White Mystery, kind of creating a, an environment where a young band could get a gig in Chicago. And it seemed like there's been a bunch of really good bands in Chicago the last four or five years kind of around that scene. I don't know if I could have said that five years before that. But it seems like, do you guys feel like you're part of a wave of, of something there? Uh, Connor, what do you think? Definitely, absolutely. I mean, it's easy to say that because now like, I, know, I know these bands and I know these people, and I didn't before. But it definitely feels that way, that there's a lot of good things, good music happening in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's getting out away from Chicago. You know, like Knee High, they're touring. The Boxers, another band who toured, Modern Vices. Yeah. They're all, they all started here and, you know, Got, got their legs and everything, and now they're going out. So, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Right. All I right, before we, we finish with you two guys giving us your light bulb moments, let me frame it even more. You're talking about the DIY tours, the house shows, okay? But you're a kid in the suburbs of Chicago beginning to play music with your friends here in high school. Don't you know you were supposed to have bought a sampler or an electronic keyboard and done EDM? No. 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 Uh, I don't think any of us could tell you about that. That's actually my, what my side project is kind of involved in. It's, it's you got an EDM. Uh, yeah, but we'll get to that later, I guess. Yeah, yeah Connor's the one to ask about that. He makes a lot of beats. Yeah, that's, that's not a lie. Beatmaster, Connor. Yeah. He's producer. Uh, so, Clay, why did you pick up a guitar? Uh, um, I don't know. There was always a lot of music around the house playing, uh, you know, playing music. Uh, all my dad's records and things like that. And I think uh, my mom actually kind of had all of us like learn musical instruments, uh, like made us do it, sort of. And so God I bless the guitar. her. Actually, before that, I, had, I was learning the flute, but I, that was like a <laughs> short-lived. <laughs> um, but I guess when I knew I wanted to do it was um, I went to see a uh, old Chicago band called the Red Walls. Yeah. Played at uh, the Metro. It's probably like, I don't know, 11 or so. And uh, yeah, I went to see them there and it was just, I don't know, they looked cool. They looked yeah. like they were having a good time, sounded good. They were young dudes. It was a very lucky they, like, first they show. Lived, they lived good. a little too much. So maybe just before you guys get to that point, pull back a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had like the whole like, well, I'd never like really been to a show, but they had like the whole, you know, like Beatles regalia, you know, yeah. it's like, they looked, yeah, they looked pretty interesting, so. Great band. Yeah, and they were about the age you guys are now when you, when you saw them. You know, they were part of that way. But they, they, you know, they sort of went away, and it seems like this, this generation seems to have a little more legs. Well, they got that advance from power. the major label, and then kind of uh, like the Roadrunner <laughs> just went right off the cliff. Yeah. We're going to yeah. talk about that in a second. There, there's a lot to talk about here, but let's uh, get Colin's uh, story. Colin, do you get a lot of crap from the band because you're the new guy? Are you always going to be the new guy in the band? He's got the coolest <laughs> stash, though. No, not, I don't really get that much crap about it, which is pretty cool. They're pretty, they, I feel loved with these guys around. Uh, my first light bulb moment, I guess, was I was like super young, and I remember watch, I was like watching the TV, and uh, Jimi Hendrix Live at Berkeley was on, and I was just like, I want to do that. Mm. I have to do that. I was like five or four, and then I got a guitar like the next day. I can do that. Yeah, I'm kind of not nearly as good as he can, but <laughs> I still <laughs> I like to do it. It's fun. Right. Well, you know, and, and Jim was mentioning this whole thing about, you, you know, there, there's obviously other styles of music out there that are hugely successful. But what I found interesting about, um, you know, this, it's a, almost like a generational thing. There is a lot of, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
but it seems like there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination, a lot of, I know that guy, he knows that guy, and even though you may play different styles of music, uh, there's sort of a, a scene building around a, a generation of people who aren't particular about a certain kind of music, like, oh, I'll listen to Chance the Rapper, and I'll listen to Twin Peaks, and it's all cool music to me. It's made my, my this is my generation's music. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems that way, and it seems like a more open-minded approach. Well, it's tough to say for us how it might have used to have been, but uh, I think, and this relates to to how you were saying, you know, the last five years with the scene coming out here and how you didn't know if you could say it was like that five years before that. I think a big part of it is just like music is so much more accessible and people's personality and their music is more accessible now that we have the internet. And it's just the way that mm -hmm. it's, it's promotion, but it's also just, you know, it's much more intuitive of just like, this is who I am. And it's so much easier to get that out there and have it accessible to listeners and fans and people. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's, it's tough to pinpoint exactly how, but I think it has played a hugely like drastic role in why, why everything's taking off like that. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, as far as us and Chance the Rapper go, a part of that, too, is just similar age group, hometown right. dudes who are doing well. It's, you know, that's something it's easy for people to latch on to and uh, feel pride in. You mm -hmm. know, I feel proud of Chance. Uh, yeah, I think he's proud of us. I think <laughs> also, like, Chicago really has never had its own sound, really. Like, yeah. you, you can pinpoint, like, a West Coast sound right now as far as rock and roll goes. And... And that's the same for rap, Detroit. for East Coast, and yeah. you know all that. Um, but I, and I think that's why, like we we just we kind of learn to accept all sorts of different kinds of music, especially when we're all young and we can see each other in, you know, like we're all like such good friends because we can relate to all these people, you know. Um, and I guess the music has almost come second to that but uh. of course there are downsides to this incredible tool of the internet that you guys have two albums sunken 2013 wild onion last year have you made a dime from the sale of recorded music ever i have no idea <laughs> I, I don't know <laughs> I, don't so. I don't think any of us <laughs> really have any idea <laughs> i was just curious about that <laughs> Maybe. you guys um, need to hire an accountant i think that's uh, step one there's there's nothing to count yeah. greg yeah. there's yeah. nothing to count <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> somebody's making some something somewhere along something the line. is happening not anymore yeah. for yeah. live music i mean but you made milwaukee last night what'd you take home enough to cover gas uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, this yeah, year has been pretty That's, that's pretty when nice. you make some money, when you actually sell the actual record at the show. True. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Take the $20 you put in your pocket. <laughs> don't put it in your pocket. <laughs> hey, you don't, don't put it in your pocket. That's what you've been yeah. doing this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> what have don't you been doing? In your hey, pocket. Man, I got to eat, you know. You got to keep this guy away from the merch table. <laughs> all, all of a sudden, I cursed everybody else in the band. Wait a minute, Clay took that money, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we've all done it once. He yeah. caught himself <laughs> putting 20 bucks in his wallet yesterday, and he was like, oh, oh wait, sorry. Yeah, exactly. So that has a lot of truth to it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you start out recording on GarageBand, right? Yeah. This tool that didn't even exist. Uh, and I've been impressed by how many videos you guys have made and how ambitious they've done. I, I assume for no money. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. I'm not sure about that. No, no budget. I and mean, we've also never, like, spent a dime, really. So on the records or videos. So that's good. We, we've spent a dime. <laughs> well, it's like money that isn't wasn't really ours to begin with. You know? Yeah, it's, it's not it's not my dime. Not yeah, your dime. Yeah. Somebody's dime. Do you have friends do the video, or is it is it? Well, uh, our, our friend Ryan Ohm has done a lot yeah. of the videos. Not not all of them, but most of them. And he's actually from Elmhurst. It's like a lot of the younger bands in the scene coming to the city. Uh, it seems like quite a cool thing going on out there, but. Uh, yeah, he, he just kind of hit us up at one point and wanted to do something and got along so well, went so well, the Stand in the Sand video, the first one we ever did, second one, but first real one, and uh, just rolled from there. And he's someone who can take nothing and turn it into something, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's talk about the records a little bit. Uh, Jim mentioned Sunk in the first record, which is very a very DIY record, kind of very homemade kind of record. Um, and the sound seemed to be, nonetheless, the sound seemed to be in place. Um, you know, five guys growing up with all this kind of music. Was it instant, kind of like, this is what we're going to play, guitar-based, rock and roll? Uh, was there any kind of, you know, 
get in a room and let's see what comes out or did you kind of know ahead of time okay this is what we're going to be uh, well, before we even started recording well when we did that record we knew what was going into it it was eight songs we'd been playing as a set and we were going out on tour I had nothing to sell so we said let's record that and there was no ambition past that at that point it was just a demo tape you know mm -hmm. but before that we'd been playing together uh, me, Connor, and Jack, and then Clay came along. We were with a friend called Lucas Herzog. But there was definitely experimentation with different styles, and I think we've continued to do that. But, you know, we used to do kind of, we were into Grizzly Bear and wanted to have kind of more psychedelic, weird stuff, and none of it stuck that much. And we kind of, it, it became obvious what we were good at and what we loved to do mm -hmm. probably a year before we did Sunk In. Right. Yeah our, yeah, our first shows were kind of crazy because we were playing, like, punk, really punk songs, really fast punk songs, and then, like, a reggae song. Yeah. And then, like, like yeah, like a, like a weird indie grizzly bear real estate type song. It was all over the place. You're listening to Sound Opinions. I'm Greg Codd with Jim DeRigatis. We're uh, here with Twin Peaks at the Goose Island Barrel House. Uh, we're talking about these records, and... Uh, one of the impressive facets of the band, for people who have never seen it, first of all, there's three lead singers in the band. Uh, there are multiple songwriters in the band. Uh, you know, Clay, how does that work? Usually it's one guy calling the shots in most bands. Uh, in this I case, wouldn't really know, because it's just like <laughs> the only band I've been in, but besides yeah. one other one, but um, usually we just, uh, we just write a song at home. Uh, one of us will just bring a pretty near completed song. Sometimes we'll even do demos of it by ourselves and then bring it forward and then just, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, you know, we some guy writes a song, brings it to the band and then we just start playing it, writing stuff on top of it. So yeah. What, what inspires you guys to sit down and write? Uh, you know, music. <laughs> you gotta have something to write about. Has your baby done you wrong? <laughs> Has the dog died? <laughs> <laughs> My dog's still kicking. There's not that many dead dog songs out there. <laughs> oh, that's the history of country music, dude. <laughs> oh yeah, true. I guess so. Your dog died. My pickup got uh, got got stolen, and, and my wife, my wife left took me. the kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but you know the, yet, the the thing that's interesting to me about this new record, uh, the Wild Onion record. Well, not so new, but came out last year. The ambition of the record and. There's some new colors in there and new textures, and there's some softer songs. There's some more, you know, I, wanna, I hesitate to call them romantic, but they certainly have more of a feel of, you know, it's not just all, you know, pedal to the metal, garage rock and roll. There's, there's, there's textures, there's colors in there. You're talking about sort of some of these uh, Baroque touches, you know, <laughs> instruments that are not traditional rock and roll instruments on there. How do you guys, you know, come to agreement like that? I know what it was like to be, you know, 18, 19, 20, and hey man, let's not be so sensitive. Like, you know, are we going to share our feelings again? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> what are we, an emo band? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think we're all pretty open and honest people, and we're all best buds, so it comes pretty easy. It's, you know, if one of us has the ambition to say, I just really want to try that. Mm -hmm. That's what's up to here. That's what I want to do. It's... I can't really think of circumstances where people have been shut down in this band where it's just like, no, we're not doing that. It's been pretty open to just say like, well, all right, like even if people are skeptical, they say, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. And if it turns out great, great. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, Jack, so what, what happens if somebody doesn't like something? I mean, are feelings bruised when uh, something doesn't fly? I mean, do, do you hear about it right away or how, how is that handled in the band if something's not flying in terms of the songs or the lyrics or things like that? Well, like Hayden said, I don't think we've really had any moments like that in particular um, because none of us, I guess none of us are that stubborn. I don't know. Um, I guess if, if someone doesn't really like something and they're like, and they're adamant about it, we'll usually just concede and be like, all right, yeah, let's just not do it then. Like, we'll do something else. But, um... Yeah, we like we've never really had like huge differences in opinions, uh, just because I guess we've known each other for so long. Um, it, it just that that plays a lot into it, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's good. The That's um, uh, transition from where you guys were talking about starting out in basements, 
DIY shows, right? So you, you played Lollapalooza, and you know the VIP platinum passes closest to the stage are like twenty eight hundred dollars a ticket. All right, and you're of course playing on a stage with a huge corporate sponsorship. Um, that's not where you came from. It's not what you love. It's a part of life today in the concert world. How do you deal with that? I mean, it's not so bad. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's good to get you know, paid. It's great. Yeah. I mean, really, the best thing is just to play the, play the music that we want to play to as many people as we can. And if yeah. we have to, you know, go... Yeah, but see, your friends are half a mile away. Yeah, yeah, but they're the still there. In the, in the massage tent area <laughs> right. and the, the wine bar well, area. Well, they can watch, too. They you can. know? <laughs> Um, but it, it's not, you know, it's the festivals aren't like, we were really stoked to play festivals at first, and they're still fun, but you know, it's like, it's not like playing a club, like a nice intimate club, or a house or anything, it's, it's harder, it's not as fun, but it's good, I mean, you're playing to a lot of people that, you know, new, new people that, you know, hear the music, and old people that have already heard it, it's good, it's definitely yeah. good. Yeah. Do you feel that the club infrastructure out there in America is threatened? We're lucky here in Chicago that we have a dozen great venues, but a lot of cities don't anymore. You know, like Detroit, every, every room is, is owned and run by Live Nation. Minneapolis, almost that way. You have to go to St. Paul <laughs> yeah. to not have a Live Nation room. You, you got something to say. Me? It looks like, yeah, you look oh, like. Oh, no, I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't, I, don't, I, don't. <laughs> well, I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> Yeah, I just feel like, you know, it's, I'm not super caught up in the world of promoters and all that, Live Nation buying up all the venues, and, you know, I'm sure that is a thing. I hear people, we played Vegas, and this guy was like, there's no scene out here, I'm trying to bring the scene back. And I'm sure that happens, but I also feel like, you know, bands are always going to want to play clubs, mm -hmm. and that's always going to be part of it. And so maybe things will get threatened, but I don't think that will ever go away. The kids and will I, find a way to make yeah, the music. Yeah, I mean, it's, and bands are going to find a place to play it. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't know. Maybe it's easier for us to say coming out of playing basements all the time, but it doesn't seem like a crisis to me. It's like, you know, I don't like festivals that much. I wouldn't, I don't like going to see a band at a festival. It's not the ideal location. So I don't do that. And maybe, you know, maybe I'm biased because Chicago has so many great clubs. But uh, it hasn't stricken me as some crisis or anything like that. Uh, you, you, it is you changing. Played, you played Mexico City. What was it like there? It was pretty sweet. That was cool. <laughs> it was awesome. Wow. Yeah. Um, you didn't play how so? How there, so? Well, the, yeah, and that, like it, I don't know. It's like a pretty. That's like a pretty hit place. It seemed like like people. Um, that festival was interesting too because it was all these different bands from what like twenty different countries or something like that. Like twenty or twenty or thirty. Yeah. Or something. yeah something like, and so uh, so basically, there's no way that all these people knew all these bands who were playing. And the crowd was never really empty the whole time. They were like there f to see people play music, like the whole, you know, the whole time. And that's like I, obviously that's just such a different scene than here because that's obviously not what people are going for when they go to a festival in America all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was like re that was really refreshing to see that they actually cared about music. Yeah, and that was a cool setup too, because it was a festival that had like a total of three stages or something. Two of them are right next to each other, just mm. bouncing bands. So it encourages the fan, or the, the the people who come to just be watching all sorts of bands. Yeah, and I think that is probably the biggest drawback of your Lollapaloozas, Made in Americas, Coachellas, all that stuff, is that it's just like it's it's, it's overload. It's ADD music culture, you know. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah, but you know, for some people that's life. You know, yeah. well, I, I think could, would, you know they die for that. I think one of the things about a festival that's cool for you know a young person is that you can stumble into something you would normally wouldn't see. You go, you're going to see band A, but then you stumble into band B, and like, wow, that's better than the band I went to. I'm coming to see. Um, you know, I noticed that with your appearance at Lollapalooza, the people started drifting over, and they they really they enjoyed it. I don't think they knew who you were when they were coming up, but they stopped, and you can tell. Some people stop, you know, listen for a couple of minutes, and then they just keep moving. You know, they're just moving yeah. on. But people would stay for your set, and the audience grew. And you know, not only that, you caused an evacuation. I think didn't you guys play the same day as the uh, the oh, evacuated? Yeah, the last the band before set. evacuation. Perfect got timing. Lucky. What do they do with a band uh, when they evacuate you? Did we they all make have you to. Go we anywhere? all had to leave. Was, uh, yeah, it was basically like. 
Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Yeah. And good luck, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Here's yeah, our yeah. evacuation plan. <laughs> yeah. Good you, luck. Yeah, oh. we're like we're yeah. literally like we're gonna close all of the yeah. shelter that we have provided for you, and you're just gonna go like just walk that way, and just go find somewhere to like hang yeah. out for. Don't don't worry about your gear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. So so the rules are don't die on our property. Go die. You know if you're gonna don't get killed. Don't go die in Grand Park. Exactly. Please, okay. just don't. We're at the Goose Island Barrel House. Taping sound opinions with Twin Peaks. It's a treat to have these guys here. We're going to get to some music shortly. Yes. Um, plans for the next record? Uh, so, 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 you know, from Sunken to Wild Onion, Anticipation Grew. Every show you guys play, especially the festivals, you make more fans. What's next? Are you feeling the pressure to deliver? You know, it's been interesting. They this scoff. Is like, they <laughs> scoff. And they look around at the barrels of beer. No? <laughs> this is like the least pressure we've had going into a record because, you know, it's, we're at the point now where if it doesn't grow, we have this great fan base. We're able to tour and, you know, maintain that. At least for now, our parents are still cool with us crashing at home. But, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> they you, were doing that. You. Yeah, thanks, moms and dads. Uh, but it's also... We've had the most time we've ever had to do a record... And I think also we've been doing it for long enough now that we're, we're so much more of a, of a unit than we were the last two times. And we already felt so good before. But, uh, yeah, it, it seemed like less pressure to us at this point. Because, you know, a lot of bands, I, can, I get it. It's like you have to deliver, it has to grow, all this stuff. But we've had great support from our team, of our label, our agent, all that stuff. It's just... Uh, recognizing that we're gonna make the music we want to make and take our time with it, and uh, and either it goes great or uh, I, I can't see it crashing and burning, but maybe I'll be surprised. Well, it, it's interesting because you guys are in a position now where there's a lot of things probably being asked of you and proposals being made to you. Um, Kaden, you've got firsthand experience. Your brother was in a band, Smith Westerns, that. Um, you know, was fairly successful. Uh, signed to a major label deal. Um, I think it was a major, right? Or a don't big, believe big they indie. Were, they were, they were mom and pop and fat possum. Big indie, those, right? Yeah. yeah, a big indie. And then, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about the, the next step with this group. Uh, do you even need a label? Do you even need to get signed? Is that even an ambition uh, of a group like this? You have friends in a band called the Orwells that signed a, a big label deal. Right. Um, and, and you're probably watching all of this stuff, observing. How did it go? What, what can we learn out of this? What, what are you learning out of these situations? Well, it's interesting as far as, like, the do you need a label question. It's, it's awesome seeing, like, Chance, for instance, go with no label and be absolutely crushing the game. You know, it's, it's awesome. And I've, I've thought about that a lot, and it's like, to one extent, I, I wish we could do that and be, like, an entirely independent thing, but... Uh, we're definitely not making enough money to do that, you know. We're not getting the guarantees someone like that is getting where... And he's also not physically releasing his music, you know. There's no vinyl that's being mm -hmm. paid for and all that. So I do feel like at this point, we're not having, you know... Label doesn't pay for all our shirts or anything like that, but they get the music out there, and that's the most important thing. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's great when you can be with a label where it's, it's not a bummer. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, we're with a label that we love, the people on the label, we're like-minded, it's, it's great. Um, and, you know, there's the major label thing that we haven't directly experienced, so I can't truly say, but it just never felt right to us. Uh, and you, that's where you hear about the 360 deal stuff, where they are paying for the merch, and they're taking a cut of all that merch, and... You, they give you all this money, but then you make no money until that money gets recouped. Right. And, you know, I, I, we haven't experienced it, but that, that seems to be where it just, like, feels convoluted and too much. And so I think there's people, independent labels are doing a good job of finding a way to be as lightweight as possible, but help the band get the exposure right. and get the, the vinyl and the CDs out there, you know. All right. So uh, we, we like to play this game with uh, guests, uh, Games. you know, the, the Desert Island Jukebox game, all right? So five guys like you who are in the van as much as you are, you have to reach some compromises. Right? So this is not a song <laughs> that I want you to pick to define you for all time, but uh, give us a tune today that you couldn't live without at this moment, time and place. Magnet by NRBQ. Amen. Yep, NRBQ. that's it. Oh, wow, we got Now three. that is traditionally like your 55-year-old white rock critic band. <laughs> NRBQ, you know, because like every song has 17 references to 
What, why does a young fella like you love NRBQ? It's just great songwriting. It's a, uh, you know, great production. I can't say I love NRBQ to be honest. I haven't okay. dived in that much. It's but that, that song, song is genius. That song. What's and it so about when that you song? ask that, that's a song that's been on in the van every day for the past year. There's days where it's like, wow. you know, hey, run it again, uh, put it back on, <laughs> it again, three times again. in a day. Uh, so it was just an easy answer there. I, yeah. And RB, you know, and it's funny too, we've, we've gotten dad rock a lot. It's like people <laughs> yeah. describing the music, not a lot maybe, but it's, you know, it's like a joking offhand comment. It's like they play dad rock. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, dads yeah. love us too. And that's we love our dads. dads. We love, love dads. We love our dad's music. <laughs> so I don't know. Give me it's, another one. Anybody else got another tune? A uh, good road song, a uh, song called Candy by The Men. Mm. That's a good one. I listen to that quite a bit on the road. Why? What, what is it that you love about it? Oh, it's just the way it sounds. It's just, you know, it's like, you know, you like picture a highway when you hear it. And if you're on the highway when you're listening to it, then it's, you know, it's nice. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the lyrics are good. It's just kind of like... Uh, not super intelligent, um, you know. <laughs> uh, it's easily relatable, you know. Lost, you know. Quit my job, you know. I'll stay out all night long, type thing. You know, just real simple, you know, from the heart music, good stuff. All right. Well, I'm eager to hear you guys uh, play some more tunes. So, uh, what do you say we we do that? And thank you so much, Twin yeah, Peaks, for you. coming in. Thanks thank for you guys for us. having us. Thank yeah, you absolutely. very much. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you.